All right, welcome to the live stream, folks. Uh, let me see. I know we got some few folks on here already. Chris, Eric, there you go, Matt. Hey, how's it going? Uh, tonight's topic is downsell to upsell. Hashtag sales after dark, man. So, again, um, hey, let me know again. Remember to give me some feedback on what you think of these and what I could add, what I could subtract, what you like, what you don't like. I, I don't take these things personally. So, Milwaukee in the house. Inkle, John spelled the wrong way. Hey, Victor, excited for tonight once again. Can you do us a favor? What is that? Can you do your closing, the thing speech you are doing in your seminars later? Uh, thanks a lot. You like? Oh, it's not the thing. It's the thang. And so, oh, so you watch my documentary, man. So the thang is, um, that's like my closing. When I want to do a big motivational speech, I do the thang. I might do it, man. I might do it, man. Well, here, let me get it out of the way now. Let me get it out of the way now. By the way, if you're watching this on the replay, fast forward five minutes, because I got to connect with my peeps right here real quick. So I have this thing called, uh, when I end a speech, I always ask people to pledge to their success, right? So I tell people to put their finger up in the air. Right? And I said, repeat after me. It says, I will rise above doing what I love. I will make that dough doing what I know. And I say, those who laugh can kiss my, that whole thing. Because I say that in life, you should never do a thing. You should always do a thing. See, a thing is what you do uh, that you don't really like. You'll never be happy. You'll never make a lot of money. But when you do your thing, that's a big difference. So when I tell people, rise above doing what you love, make that dough doing what you know, because in the end, it's about doing your thing. So check out The Motivator, which is a free, uh, it's a documentary I did about, uh, man, almost 10 years ago now. Uh, but I always end my motivational speeches with the thang, John Ankle. So check it out. Uh, my kids are dancing to the hype music. You're such a good mom. You're such a good mom. They're probably going to be learning to be great salespeople too. TJ Salgado, finally, I'm early. There you go, man. We missed you, man. Hi from Jacksonville, Barbara Tyree. Oh, here she is. Mia Knox is in the house. Okay. Uh, Filipinos love strange spellings of their kids' name. They do, man. I'm just messing with him. Inkle knows I like him, man. So he's all good, man. Tahir Parawala. I just like saying that, man. India in the house. Man, I just got to pause here. I think this is Hal Coleman's first time on my live stream. Now, Hal Coleman is a good friend of mine. And so... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay respect and get credit where credit's due. A lot of you know me for saying, if you listen to my Sales Influence podcast, I said, you know, it begins with finding the why and how people buy, right? And then how do I end it? Selling ain't hard when you know how. And so that line came about when I was talking to Hal Coleman over coffee. And we were talking about leadership or something. And then Hal Coleman was the one that says, selling ain't hard when you know how. And I said, man, I think I'm going to use that. So that is the originator of the actual phrase, and we were just talking about, you know, business in general. And I said, you know, Hal, I'm just going to have to steal that line. So credit goes to my man, Hal Coleman. Thanks, Hal, for joining us, man. So, gracias. Selling ain't hard when you know how, man. Uh, ready for the new content? Boom. Glad you're here. Johnard Owens. Hey, Victor, man, is this your first time, man? Let me know where you're from. Johnard Owens. Let me know where you're from. Robin Cole from the heartland. Hey, Gabriela Hernandez from Indiana. Uh, Mel de la Rosa, Marcia Warren Aguirre. Uh, what is all that, Gabriel? I have no idea. Ah, dinero y motivación is back. Ya llegué, por fin. Me hacías falta. Okay, Mike Janice in the house, man. Welcome, man. And then there is Bridget. Good evening, Victor. Good to see you. H-Town in the house. Do you ever like that band, Bridget, H-Town? Do you remember H-Town back in the day, H-Town? You know what I'm talking about? You know what their famous song was, right? You know, let me know if you know what that is. Uh, let me see. The Taurus McDonald, Atlanta, Georgia. Dude, we're neighbors, man. I'm over here in Alpharetta, man. Uh, John and Orange from Country Club Hills, Illinois. I'm from Chi-Town originally, born and raised. And Dinero is here, so I'm, I'm super excited about that. Todd Weinstein, good to see you again. Greetings from Long Island, New York, in the house, man. Ade Odunfa. Man, you got to let me know if I got that right, man. It's building VA. Hola. So cool, man. I love it. All right. So tonight's topic, let's get into it. Uh, my man's from Malaysia, man. Thank you, man. Like I said, I mean, Singapore is just like a beautiful city. I mean, at least that part. Singapore is just a great city, man. It's like, uh, 
Uh, there's so much to do. There's, it's a beautiful city, man. You know, I think the more you travel international, for those of you who've traveled international, uh, you begin to see, you know, the world. Uh, uh, and I think you have a greater appreciation for different cultures, you know, so forth, especially different foods, right? And so I don't know if you knew this, but in the U.S., in the U.S., uh, the last statistic I read could be raw, could be updated. 75% of Americans don't have a passport. Seven, five don't have a passport, which means, you know, that means 75% of the population will never know what it is to go to another country. I think that's a shame. I think we need to get passports. We need to travel international and appreciate some of these beautiful countries. And on the topic of beautiful countries, horrible segue, let's talk downselling to upsell. Now, this may sound like an awkward strategy, but trust me, this strategy is so simple to implement, but you gotta think long-term. Now, that's the key with the strategy. To downsell, to upsell, you gotta think long-term. So let me begin with the story. The, one of the things we try to do when, we're, talk, when we're, we're meeting somebody for the first time, right? we're trying to sell somebody, is that we're trying to build some trust. So let me go back to my definition of trust, at least my favorite definition of trust, which is if I wanna build trust with any client, right? The first thing they have to know is that I understand their point of view. This is the empathy piece, right? This is that means that I really understand where they're coming from, right? Right? So I really understand the customer. So when the customer is talking about some of the issues, some of the challenges they're facing, I mean, I really understand them. I just don't go, yeah, yeah, I get it. No, I really understand it. And then on top of that, not only understanding them, what they also want you to do is to have their best interest in mind, right? So, in other words, what do I mean by best interest? First of all, the point of view, you understand me, right? Client wants to feel that, yeah, you get me, Victor. You understand our business. You understand the changes we're going through. You understand the you know, challenges we're facing. You understand rising prices, you know, costs going up, and how we're challenging the market, more competitive, hyper -com competition, so forth. You get it, Victor. But then they also want you to know the second part, which is do you have their best interest in mind? And having a customer's best interest in mind simply means that you're looking out for them and their pocketbook. You're really looking out for them. You want them to be in a better situation, but you also want to make sure that you treat their money as if it were your money. And when you can transmit these two things, I understand you and I'm going to hook you up. I'm going to look out for your best interest. I'm not going to try to oversell you or undersell you. I'm going to sell you what I think you need. And when you can transmit that in a conversation, man, you will sell because in today's market, it is trust. It is that relationship that people are buying into. Why? As we've talked about in the past, too often we have what? Products that are very similar, right? And because they're very similar, what happens? They're very similar, so they look the same. But you, the salesperson, now become the ultimate differentiator. You become that person that people say, you know, even if I pay a little more, I'd rather buy from you than that other person because I trust you. And when they say, I trust you, what they're really saying is, you understand me and you have my best interest in mind. With that said, I've set the table for downselling to upselling. Now, let me tell you a story and then tell me if this has happened to you, okay? And give me a one if this has happened to you. You ever take your car in for an oil change and you go in there for, let's say, an oil change of $39.95. You know, $39.95. By the way, there used to be this guy in Illinois, if you know who I'm talking about, Illinois. Uh, his name was Earl Schaub. I'll pay any car for $99.95. Anyway, that's what they sound like, right? You know, you bring your car, get an oil change for $39.95, right? And every time you take your car in to get an oil change, they try to sell you something else. Give me a one if you know what I'm talking about. You're just going in there for an oil change, and especially dealers. Dealers do this a lot, and I'm talking about dealerships. When you go take your car into a dealer and they give you the special, right? They send you out this promotional flyer. Come on in, bring your car in. We'll change your oil for $39.95, right? And so that happened to me. I took my car in and every time I took my car in, right? I started realizing they're always trying to upsell me, right? It's like every time they try to upsell me. Well, what happened was the last time I went to a dealer to actually get my oil changed, I noticed a pattern, but this time I said, you know what, let me ask some questions here. And what I realized, that there's a pattern to how they try to upsell you. Here's the pattern. First of all, they'll take your car to the back and they'll do a diagnostic. They'll do a diagnostic, right? Now bear with me, I'm gonna get to my point. I'm gonna show you downselling versus upselling the benefit. Let me just go through the store real quick. So they take the car, you know how you get there, you pull up, 
give them the car keys, and then they take it to the back and they hook it up to the machine, right? So then you wait 20, 30 minutes, and almost like on clockwork, I, I can put this down to a timer. I can just time the guy, and he'll be back in like 30 minutes, maybe 20, right? And he comes back, and then the next phase, he's going to ask me some questions, right? For example, hey, Victor. <laughs> I give you the southern action. Hey, Victor, when was the last time you brought in your car for a checkup? Now, they have the information, they know, but they ask me a couple of questions about the car, driving, so forth, you know, how's it been driving for you, so forth. And I'm like, what does this have to do with an oil change, right? And then, what they then do, after they ask a couple of questions, they then transition into, well, we looked up your record, right? So now we move to the, we looked up your records, and here's what we found, right? And after they looked up your records and they found something, they then provide a recommendation. Now, the recommendation, you know, you know that recommendation is going to cost you some money. Let me give you an example of what happened. Take my car in, 3995 for an oil change, right? Get there, pull it up. Uh, do you have a, uh, you know, are you scheduled to come in? I said, absolutely. So sure enough, I have an appointment, give them the keys go to the break room, buy the vending machine, get some coffee, sit down, chill it, right? And so all of a sudden, I'm waiting, and then all of a sudden somebody comes into the waiting room. Victor? Yeah, you. And I said, yeah, what's up? I said, can I just see you for a moment? I'm like, all right, what, right? Because it's, it's that look. It's like when somebody says, can I just talk to you for a second? And when somebody says, can I just talk to you for a second? You know it's not going to go well, right? You just know it's not going to go. I said, yeah, what's up? He said, uh... When was the last time you brought in your car? I said, I, I don't know, man. It's got to be at least three months because that's why I'm getting the oil change. Uh, and then he says, when was the last time you had your belts changed? You know, different types of belts, timing belts, whatever, fan belts, the whole bit. I go, mm, I, uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, I don't have that information in my head. Well, we checked our records. And what we found is that, you know, you didn't have a 50,000 mile checkup for your belts. And then the recommendation comes in. We recommend that you change after 50,000 miles, you change your belts, right? That was the recommendation. To which I say like, uh, right? How much, right? And he says, now remember, I just came in for 39.95, right? And all of a sudden, this is without the oil change. It's 179.95, something like that, right? So it's gonna be that plus that plus tax. And I'm like, what? I said, but then, you know, for this time I was like a little, I'm not gonna say upset, but I just got had to ask the question. I said, okay. I said, well, how do the belts look? I literally asked him this. Well, how do the belts look? Because that's a, that's a lot of money. How much do the belts look? You know what they look like? He goes, well, I, I don't know. That's what the you know the mechanic told me. Uh, what was going on. I said, but wait a minute, did you look at the belt though? He goes, well, I didn't. The mechanic looked at it. I said, well, what did the mechanic say about the belt? He goes, well, I don't know. He just, you know, I just noticed that, you know, you had not checked your belts since, you know, it's been 50,000 miles. You haven't changed your belts. I said, well, can you go back and ask him the conditions of the belts? I mean, this is like logical stuff, right? This, you, did you look at it? Did you like physically look at it? And so sure enough, he goes back and he t talks to the mechanic, talks to the mechanic. For all I know, he went to the break room, right? Came back, he says, well, you know, they, they don't look bad, but they, they should be replaced. I strongly, I love when they say this to me, I strongly recommend you replace the belts. I said, but, I mean, are they to the point of failure? Are we talking bad, horrible here? Are, are we talking good or bad or horrible? What are we talking? He's like, well, we just recommend, strongly recommend after 50,000 miles. He's not even answering my question. Just 50,000 miles, you got to change. I said, you know what? I said, just do the oil change for now. And, you know, I'll, I'll think about that later. I'll come back because I was like a little upset. And so I did the oil change. Sure enough, done, right? And I told myself every time I come to this dealership, they pull this crap out of me, right? So this time I, so I have a neighbor across the street. His name is John. And I remember one day talking to John. And I told him my experience. He says, well, I know a guy. His name is James, right? And I have a Volvo, right? So he says, he specializes in Volvos, right? I said, oh, is this guy going to be expensive? He goes, no, he's a good guy. You should go see him. I think before you take your car next time to the dealer, why don't you just go to James first? So sure enough, I go to James. And so this time, so this is like four months later or something, right? And I'm going back for an oil change. And sure enough, I get there, 
pull into the place. It's not a dealership. It's owned by this guy named James. Uh, I don't even know his last name. But what, what happened was in 30, 40 minutes, he's done. He comes to the break room and he says, we're done. And I go, what? He said, I go, we're done. He says, you're ready to go. Are you ready to pay? Check out. I go, and I'm like confused because I've been so used to getting upsold that I just like, I was totally confused. And so I remember going to the counter. I said, uh, well, what about, I mean, did you check out the whole car? He says, yeah, we did the whole, you know, the routine checkup. We did look, look at your oil, look at your, your levels, da 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 you look at your timing belts, your, da, da, all that. Well, what about the belts, I said. He goes, well, I mean, they, they looked okay. They looked fine. Nothing to be concerned about. And I'm like, immediately I'm thinking, that guy lied to me at the other place, right? He says, now, I did notice that your air filter were a little dirty, so I'm going to strongly recommend that the next time you come back, you change them out. And we'll look at it then, but I'm going to make a note here in my, my system, right? Next time you come back, and I'm like, and I'm walking out of there almost stunned, right? Because he said, you know, whatever the deal was, that's what I paid, and that was it. And sure enough, the next time I came back, he pulled up his notes. He said, I'm going to look at this. We talked about this last time. And then it, it got to the point where I trust him so much today that I, I've given James, I've been with James now 15 years. I've been taking my Volvo. Yeah, I have a 20-year-old Volvo, by the way. And I've been taking my Volvo, my baby, to this guy for the last 20 years. Why? Because whatever James tells me to do to my car, I do. See, he's learned to downsell just to upsell. He doesn't try to sell me everything I need. When I go in there, he says, you need this, this. We don't need to do this right now. We can move that six months out or we can do that on the next rotation. This right here, we're going to have to do. You need that. And that's what people want. See, that's real selling in today's market. You're thinking long term. See, he's not trying to upsell you the whole bag right there and then. He's actually downselling me by saying, you don't need this right now, or you don't need to do this right now. You can save that for the next time, and then I'll look at it. And so how often have you used the downsell strategy? And so here's what's happened over the last 15 years. I estimate, with when you look at repairs, oil changes, and the things, like that, just basic maintenance, I probably spend about, and I'm guessing, this is a rough number, $800 a year. And for the last 15 years, I've been taking, the last 15 years, I've been taking it to James, which means I've probably given him $12,000 over the last 15 years, right? And I'm very happy. And again, I can't tell you how many times I've taken my car in. He says, you need this, this, and this. And he says, here's the price. He said, and I'll say something, do I really need to do this? He says, yes, you do. And he says, you're going to do this and I'm not letting you, I mean, one time he said, I'm not letting you drive the car off the lot without doing this. So you have to do that. I was like, wow, he must really mean it. So that's downselling. Now, let me give you two more examples of downselling. Another downsell that was interesting is that when we put our roof on top, we had a guy come over. He did the same thing. He said, he says, you know, we were talking about these special shingles that are lighter and brighter and it'll be more energy efficient for the roof. You know, uh, it, uh, it was more white. It was white earth, so it wouldn't absorb as much sun. And the guy said, no, that, that'd be a waste of money. I wouldn't use my money there. So what he says, you don't want to invest, when you look at the shingles, he said, these new shingles, these special plus singles, he says, you don't want to spend your money there. So he down, so don't spend your money there. Let me tell you where you should. And he, he did something called, he says, you want to put some extra money into ridge vents. And by the way, if you don't know what a ridge vent is, if this is your roof, they put a little vent on top so the air can escape, right? The little ridge vents. He says, that's where you should put your money. So he says, don't put your money here. You don't have to spend that much money here. The, the, the regular shingles will work just fine. Da, 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 get these. So he downsold me. In other words, not that expensive. But he says, where I would put the money is right here if you want maximum efficiency. And still, the amount of money I saved here, let's say this was, I'm making a number up, if this was $1,000 I saved here, this cost me another $500 here. So in the end, I came out like $500 ahead in this whole game. And I remember that. I remember the guys, and I'm thinking, well, I just saved $500 because he downsold me just to upsell me. Now, what do you think is going to happen when somebody asks me, who do you recommend for your roofing? I'm going to that guy. I'm sending him more business. That's downselling to upselling because that's a long-term play. Today, I have a coaching client, and I, we were walking through actual selling, and we talked about downsell strategies, and guess what he started implementing? Downsell strategies. So what he would say to a customer if they were doing a kitchen, he says, you don't want to spend that much on your counters. So he downsold them on the counters, but then what you really want to do 
for resale value is you want to put more money into your cabinets. And again, he used that whole balancing thing. You downsell to upsell because that's what people want. They want you to guide them through that decision-making process. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about tonight. That was the topic of the evening. And so if you've used downselling to upselling, let me know because the benefits are obvious, right? The benefits are one, I think it's a lot, you got, you look at customer lifetime value. And in James's example, you know, $12,000, you know, over 15 years. If you're a large enterprise company, can you imagine how much money, let's say a customer spends, I don't know, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 with you every year and they trust you so much, 50 times 10, that's half a million dollars if you're looking at a large system. So one is that it's long time value. Two, uh, this may sound funny, but when you downsell to upsell because you're being honest, you feel better about how you sell. And I love that. I love, I love feeling good about how I sell. Yeah, in the short run, I'll make more money, but I have a satisfied customer and it's a value for value exchange. And I feel better about how I sell. And the third benefit is that obviously I know because karma's in play all the time, I'm gonna get some referrals. And if I get some referrals, that's more money for me long-term. And if you add all these three up, why wouldn't you wanna downsell to upsell if you have a long-term game? So anyway, that's my topic for tonight. I'll take any questions, I'll go through the comments. I know you guys have been handling comments here. So let me go through some of the comments. If you have any questions, now would be the time. So some of you have been through this. Uh, Forever Fitness is back. Tony, man, welcome back, man. Uh, the grand, the grand fire expert. Uh, someone wants to buy some pasta. How do I upsell him on the sauce? Someone wants to buy pasta. How do I upsell them on the sauce? I mean, think about upselling in the, in the easiest way. Have you ever noticed that like waiters are the best upsellers? If you ever want to study upselling, just look at a waiter, just watch how they do it. Watch the best waiters do that. The best waiters, I've noticed this about waiters, uh, you know, it's like when you go to McDonald's, would you like fries with that shake, right? Would you like fries, you know, with that burger? And you go, that's an upsell, right? Somebody says pasta, would you like, if I was doing, if I just sold you pasta, I would sell you the pasta. I said, now, what would go good with that pasta is that we have three different types of sauces. One is a cream sauce, one is a mushroom sauce, one is a tomato sauce. I highly recommend the mushroom sauce. What do you think? Right? And all of a sudden, that's like an assumptive close. I assumed you were going to get one of the pastas, right? Or one of the sauces. My other favorite uh, order taking technique from uh, the best of the best is when you finish dinner, you know, the, the best sales, the best, I guess, waiters or waitresses don't say, you know, are you ready for dessert? Would you like dessert now? Do you have room in your stomach for dessert? It's a horrible question to ask. That's not a good upsell. The ultimate upsell for a waiter or waitress is the following. So you finish with it, you're coming back, you're clearing out stuff, he says, now. And then they hand you the dessert menu. I said, here's the dessert menu. He says, let me just highlight three of the most popular desserts we have here. We have the creme brulee, blah, 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 blah. We have the coconut flan, da, da, da. And ultimately, we have the chocolate cheesecake. Which one of these can I get for you? And by the way, it's okay if you split amongst yourselves. You know what I mean? So I'm not asking if they want. I assume somebody's gonna eat a dessert. So the best upselling is also the assumptive sale if you wanna talk about pure, pure upselling. Uh, we don't mind VA, okay, cool. Herb Wash is back. Earl Shive has a third out of 170 largest auto body shops in Denver metro area by volume based on his strategy. Right, Earl Shive was the guy who would just sell like, he'll, again, I'm a little older than you probably, Herb, but I remember when he was always selling these cars, now you hit, all you would hear is that commercial, hi, this is Earl Shive, I'll paint any car for $99.95. And I was like, what a great commercial. So, all right, beautiful, love it. Thank you for the feedback. You know what I'm talking about. Jada, Jada Beats. Jada, do you actually do beats? That'd be cool. Leonardo Murray, less is more, isn't it? Uh, it's the way it is. Create a vision for, uh, here it is, the full comment right here. Create a vision for the customer over a few years, sell them the immediate need, and paint the picture of where they will be uh, and in their time frame. Great question to ask is where do you want to be with this in three years, right? So 
when you're looking at long term, by the way, Mike, thank you very much. When you're looking at long term, right, long term upselling, you want to ask the customer, I said, so what's what's your long term version vision of this? Let's say three years in this case, as you're saying, Mike, three years. So after a year, so what's kind of your roadmap to get there? Then I get more specific. After the first year, what do you, where do you want to be? What do you want to be doing? What do you want to have available? Second year and then third year. Okay, so then you set milestones. You know, and if it's a very complicated project, then you said multiple milestones within that year. So that's another way of really upselling and putting them on a clock. Mianox, will this approach work when dealing with quotas? When you're dealing with a quota, can you help me out on that one, Mia? I don't know, I don't think I know what you mean. Will this approach work when dealing with quotas? By, are you trying to hit a quota? Help me out a little bit on that so I can come back to it, okay? Uh, this one, how good can you get reaching sales books and then applying it to the real life scenario in this technique mentioned in any book? Is this technique mentioned in any book? Uh, well, first of all, I mean, I just read because, you know, I read a lot of books. And one of the reasons I read a lot of books is because you get different opinions. And sometimes it's not so much that it's solely different. It's just a little different. For example, this book, Smart Calling, Art Subcheck, right? This is the one I'm covering on Sunday, by the way. Now, I know a lot about cold calling, or in this case, smart calling, but as I was going through the book, and I'm like, uh, I'm almost there, that much left, right? At the end, that much left right there. And there was a couple of things in here that I was like, huh, well, that's a nice way of saying it. Well, I never looked at it that way. And so every time I read, think of the word, uh, to me, the word that comes to mind is iteration. Every time I you know, read something, I go, oh, I can adjust my pitch this way. Maybe I'll change the words, flip it that. Ah, that's a different model. I didn't look at it that way. So I think reading is critical. I would put myself, if I were you, the grand fire expert, try to put yourself on a diet of at least, at least one book a month. Two would be great, but at least one book a month. And is this technique mentioned in any books? Yes, my upcoming book, Upselling is the New Prospecting. And again, I need to launch the book. Uh, because of the pandemic, I've delayed the launching of the book. And so, but I thought I'd talk about it tonight. So I'm glad you're hanging in there. What if I only sell one product? Then you're not upselling anything, Stephen. But Stephen, if you really dig deep, dig deep, like dig, dig deep, Stephen, is there something you can wrap around that product? Is there some type of service? Is there some type of maintenance contract? Is there something that you can wrap around that thing? You know what I mean? And then do the upsell. Now, if you're only selling one product and there's no way of down, there's no way of downselling it, then one may, one may, I don't know what you're selling, but let's say it's a, it's an expensive product, right? Maybe it's one product, but it's an expensive product. But one thing you can do is you can downsell the, the payment plan, right? So look, we typically do net 30, but just for you, man, we're going to do net 60. That's kind of, because I think it'll give you more time to pay off whatever it may be, but it's tougher when you only have one product, Steven. So, uh, I would try to add other products to it, you know what I mean? And then now if the customer is looking at three, let's say you sell product A, you have a service contract and you have a maintenance contract and you bundle that all together, right? Product, service, maintenance, product, service, maintenance. And then you bundle it all and say, here, it's a thousand bucks. He says, you know, Mr. Customer, I don't think you really need the maintenance contract. So let's pull that out and then let's initiate the service contract after a year. So really just pay for the product. That's one way of kind of looking at a downsell opportunity to get that credibility. So let me know if that kind of helps you a little bit. Uh, Ada, hey, babe, hope, uh, hope yourself and your family are, are keeping what we are, man. We're doing good, man. Considering the current COVID situation in Atlanta, all is good. Uh, we've opened up Atlanta quite a bit here. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I, I, I keep reminding people is that we're testing more. So we're finding, you know, people are, you know, registering positive you know, for, for the COVID-19. But, you know, when you look at the number of deaths, you know, we seem to be going down. So, you know, the trend is very good. And so hopefully, you know, we'll come out the other side some, sometime, sometime soon, and everybody's, you know, in a better situation. Excellent point of view, POV, and best interest in mind to create trust. Thank you so much, Cheryl. You're very welcome. Uh, I'm telling you, Matt, that, that really works. Terrence, thank you for chiming in. All right, we got Singh Shockman like that dude i don't know what that look you're giving me man it's like hey Vic, what's up all right hi victor what would you do to change the situation if you realize you've you've upsell or recommend the wrong item you say to the customer i've actually recommended the wrong item you know there's no once you do something I, you know for me you know saying i believe that once you make a mistake i just like to confess it up front and look by the way we've added this product here you know on the upsell right if i added that i said you're really not going to need that 
you might, one could argue that that's actually building trust, right? When you admit that you made a mistake. Sometimes we think we have to be perfect super men or super women when we're selling. Uh, the, the reality is, you know, we're just humans selling to other humans. And you can say, look, I made a mistake, I added this. The good news is you don't have to, you don't have to get that. The bad news is I recommended something you're not gonna need. The good news is you don't have to buy, which means your bottom line will be that much cheaper. So you can frame it that way. So let me know if I answered your question. Uh, yep, fast food chains, they, they do the upsell well. Love this, this is always Victor. What different skill sets does it involve between upsell and cross-sell? Okay, good point. So, Rod, keeping me honest, man. Always keeping me honest, man. So, so let's define the terms, because some people may not really understand the term, because now I basically, you know, talk about, we talked about downselling to upsell. But then there's, so let's define what upselling is. Upselling, and my favorite example, if you buy a burger, right? If you buy a burger and I said, would you like to make it a double, right? It's the same product. So that to me is an upsell, right? Because I sold you more. So if you're selling, for example, a computer and you're selling something with, you know, one terabyte, right? You want to say, you know what? Since you're buying a computer, maybe you should go to two terabytes. Since you're doing so many, so much processing, so much storage, that's upselling, right? Because you're up making, selling more of the same product. A cross sell is when you sell the burger, right? And then you add, these are the fries. Then you add the fries. That is a cross sell because it has nothing really to do with the burger, but it has everything, you know, and this is, the fries has nothing to do with the burger directly. So for example, if you're buying a computer, they're gonna say, hey, by the way, you know, would you like to buy this bag that goes with that computer so you can carry your computer around or something that uh, attaches? Would you like to buy an additional monitor to go with your laptop so you'll have a bigger screen? That's an example of a good cross sell. So what different skill sets are required? Not much. I think the uh, in the book that's coming out, I talk about how do you begin to frame the conversation early, Rod, when you're talking to somebody? So the, the skill set you need specifically is you need to ask a lot of questions about what they're doing. So for example, if I'm selling you a computer, I'm gonna ask you a lot of questions. What are you gonna use it for? Do you travel a lot? Now, what do you use it for is gonna tell me how much power, capacity, processing power you need, how much storage capacity you need. Do you travel a lot? Maybe size is an issue. Maybe you say, no, I don't travel at all, Victor. This is just for me at home, working on, and I'm actually doing a lot of, you know, you know, I work for a production company. I just do a lot of film editing. That tells me, one, you're going to need a lot of storage and a lot of processing speed, and your RAM better be big, right? You know, fast, rather. And so then I also know because you're in front of a computer all the time, I asked you the question, you know, how much time do you spend editing movies? I said, man, I could be in, that, in front of that computer from 10 to 12 hours. So now I'm going to pay attention to that. I said, he probably wants a larger monitor and resolution matters. So I'm, you know, I'm going to look for some retina displays or high definition type TVs to, or screens to recommend him. So by asking the right questions, now when I get to the upsell, I sell him on the computer. I said, by the way, you mentioned that you spend about 10 to 12 hours in front of a computer screen. Is that, is that right? He goes, yeah, that was right. He says, I want to show you something. And then boom, you take him. I said, look at this computer screen. Da, 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 da. You know, it'll reduce, you know, the impact on your eyes also because it's this, whatever it may be. But notice that by asking questions and listening for the answer, knowing what you want to hear already, later on, once you close the first deal. Now, that's, this is important, Rod, that you have to close the deal on the computer first before you attempt an upsell or before you attempt a cross sell. This is important, get the commitment first. So you're gonna go with that computer, so forth and so on. They're gonna go, yep, that's the one I'm going with. Got a question for you. And then that's when the upsell or cross sell begins. So good listening skills, good questioning skills. So Ada Han from Saremban, Malaysia. Welcome aboard, repeat business is always good, Bridget. Todd Weinstein, what do you got, bro? What do you got, man? That moment, that moment when you just get a text from a coworker who is an amazing sales beast giving you an industry specific example of downselling to upsell. Love the energy, Vic. You always bring it. Thank you very much, man. Appreciate it. Dimitri Wolfson. You gotta love that. Upsell is supersized. Complimentary cross sales is exactly what I said. So Dimitri, you are on it, man. Good man, good man. Uh, can't wait to read your newest book. Can't wait to apply this to my business. Carol, welcome. And yeah, we'll have it. 
the grand fire expert is back. Is selling and negotiating persuading any different or are they different terms for the same thing? No, I think they're different actually. Uh, what negotiating is, you know, has a lot to do with anchoring pricing or, you know, setting price frames, right? So let's do broad. So in other words, when you're going into a negotiation, you have to figure out what terms or conditions you're looking for, but you also have to think about, you know, what's your floor? What's the lowest you're willing to go? So you got these are things you got to think through. And then also within negotiations, you're talking about what strategies will you use? When will you present certain things? When will you sequence things? Because sequencing is important. Persuasion is using, you know, like for example, leading questions. Now it's how you ask the questions, how you get these little verbal commitments throughout, and then presenting an argument. That's the persuading piece. And so I think they're different terms, right? So I would look at them differently. So yeah, they're very different terms. They're very different. Uh, I, I do it today with my clients. Excellent, Bridget. Make the extra money. Hola, Victoria. It's Victor, but I'll take that anyway. It's not the first time that's happened to me. Anyway, Aaron Chow. Hi, Victor. Just a question. How do I downsell to upsell car insurance and bundle that with a personal loan? Just a question, how do I downsell? So you want to upsell car insurance, right? You want to upsell, it's an interesting question. Let's, let's come, let, me, let me think about this because I'm trying to understand what you're asking me. So did you sell the car already? So you've sold the car and you want to sell them car insurance and bundle that with a personal loan. Let me think about that because I think you sold them the car already, right? So you want to upsell them car insurance and a personal loan. So you want to package those two things together while they're there. So the, so let me just, by the way, I'm very visual as you guys, I've already told you, here's the car you're going to buy. That's a car. Don't laugh at my drawing. All right, I'm going to pull that down here. That's my car. So that's a window and that's a door. That's a headlight right there. So, okay. Now, so then I sold them the car. So I want to sell them car insurance, right? Car insurance. And then I want to sell them the what? You want to do a personal loan. So this is what's throwing me off. Is it a, when you say a personal loan, uh, you know, there's, there's different types of loans, right? There's loans that's backed by equity and there's loans that are not backed by equity. So what's this back? I don't, this is what's confusing me. When you say a personal loan, you know, like extra money you're going to give them. So I don't know, is that, see, there's the car loan, but again, the car loan is backed by the car, right? So that's an equity loan, right? You know, even though this is a depreciating asset. So I'm confused as term to what the personal loan is. That's where I'm lost, Aaron. So if you can help me out, man, so I can better understand that. Uh, all right. Rod is going a little off topic. My little off topic coming out. Would you suggest to add Spanish to my sales arsenal, language apps plus lonely nights? What? <laughs> Look, dude, this sounds like personal counseling right now, Rod. Uh, language apps plus lonely nights. Or would that be too much of an investment and English should be sufficient? So sales arsenal, language apps plus lonely nights. So in other words, to learn Spanish, my little off topic would you suggest to add Spanish to my sales arsenal? I would only add Spanish to my sales arsenal if one, I have a big Spanish you know, clientele. That's why I would do it. So for example, if I'm selling into Latin America, you know, uh, you know yes and no. Here's what, here's what my thinking is. I've sold into Latin America and I've seen people who don't know Spanish sell into Latin America. Why? Because business people, true business people, know English. They're bilingual. I mean, everybody in the world is bilingual but us here in America. If you think about it, you know, there's the joke. If you, if you know three languages, you're trilingual. If you know two languages, you're bilingual. If you know one language, you're American because we just know English. But everybody else knows two languages and typically that second language is English. So, uh, you can invest if you want to do it for yourself, but I don't think it's a necessity or a must have in order to go after the Spanish market. So hopefully that helps. Uh, Sang, sure. Thanks so much, man. You're very welcome, man. You should have given me, you did give me four thumbs up and one of those, man. So I appreciate you, man. Uh, thank you for the, for the book recommendation. It really helped. You're very welcome. VA, can we at least downsell to scare clients today? Can we downsell to scare clients, to scare, oh, too scared clients today? Uh, yeah. I mean, really downsell is kind of reducing that anxiety, TJ. So it's a great question you're asking because 
What happens is when you're selling to a client, they're nervous, right? If they've never done business with you, keep in mind that they're going to want to try to minimize their risk, right? I always say that the brain is always looking to mitigate or minimize risk. So really, you're always trying to downsell to scared clients. In other words, you want to get them to try it. Or for, so for example, if I always use the burger example, right? If I have a single burger, a double burger, right? A double burger, and then I have, this is my triple burger. The way the brain works is that when it sees three options like this, it immediately runs to the middle. Why? It runs to the middle because it's trying to minimize the risk. This might be too big, but that might be too small, so let me go with the one in the middle. So this is a way of actually downselling indirectly. By adding one that's too big, the brain automatically, what, downsells itself. So keep in mind that if you want to downsell somebody to mitigate their risk, always present a more expensive option and just say, you know what, I wouldn't recommend this right now, where you're at, given what you're doing, I would do that in the future. I would begin here, and especially if you're not sure if this is what you really want to do. So this would be a safe place to start. So that's how I would downsell. That's a great question. I never heard it framed that way, but that's a very interesting way of looking at it. Uh, this one is, let's see what we got. But what a downsell to upsell. This is a very interesting, love your technique, man. Thank you very much. Also, Victor, the grand fire expert is back. Victor, also in a nutshell, what really closes a sale? or makes our prospect commit. It's not the one thing. Everybody's looking for the, the silver bullet, right? That magic line. Hey, Victor, give me the, the ultimate phrase. What happens is that if you look at any presentation, and this is the way I look at it, here's time and here's resistance. Initially, the customer's resistance is somewhere up here, right? So if the customer resistance is up there, let me take this out. Over time, there's resistance. So this is the beginning of your presentation. Their resistance is here. Our job, is as they're talking to us is to minimize that resistance, that fear. And then somewhere, I always say there's the buy line. They'll buy into it, right? So it's your job is to really, as you're having a conversation, make them feel comfortable. Build that trust. Take their point of view, right? Figure out what's in their best interest, you know, and really meet it. And so it's really more than one thing. And if you do this right, by the time you get here, it's not a hard close. It's just a, a nudge. It's not a hard close. So again, keep in mind that that's really the best way of approaching selling. All right, we have Carol Parker. When you upsell, is it best to discount or can you keep it at the original price? Carol, did you just bring up the D word, the discount word? Did you just actually bring up the discount word on this live stream? We don't do that, Carol. We don't discount, but it's a good question. Uh, the thing is upselling, you know, there's so many things wrong or perilous with discounting. I think when you have to discount something, uh, you typically undervalue or undermine your own value. So instead of discounting, you downsell, right? So for example, let me give you an example and then maybe you can see if this works. If I gave you a bid, right? And it had all these items and the price was $10,000, right? The price was $10,000, Carol, right? Then you say, well, Victor, that's more than I expected to pay, right? And then what I would do then, I would say, well, you know what? Why don't you do me a favor, Carol? Why don't you go ahead and take out what you don't need, just X out the lines you don't need, and then I'll go ahead and recalculate the new price. Now, you know what's gonna happen, right? They're gonna have a hard time Xing things out. They'll find one or two things, and they may land at, I don't know, I'll just say, you know, 8,900, great. So that's a way of downselling without having the discount by just saying, well, why don't you take out what you don't really need and then let's see if that can fit into your budget. You see how I'm resisting the discount? So I would always say resist discounting as much as possible. And by the way, if you are gonna, if you are gonna discount, make sure when you discount, you get something in return. Listen to me, when you discount, you get something in return. So for example, if you say, Victor, can I get 10% off? I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 10% off the price, but instead of signing a one-year contract, let's sign a two-year contract, which allows me to justify that 10% discount. How does that sound? See what I just did? They asked for something, I asked for something in return. That's a very good strategy. Always do that. All right, so, Padawala. We're gonna start wrapping up soon here. Uh, let me see. Almost every sales trainer talks about asking questions to prospects. Don't you think asking too many questions sometimes 
irritate prospects or customers, uh, maybe feel like they're being interrogated. Absolutely. The sales trainers who still talk about asking customers a lot of questions are salespeople who, you know, are probably like my age, who, who have not updated their techniques, who realize that this, the internet changed everything. You should know more about, you know, your customer walking into the meeting. You should know their business already. You should know their pain points. You should know all these things already. You should know 80 to 90%. So when you go in there, you're absolutely right. It's the quality of the questions that will determine whether they like you or trust you. If you go in there and ask them questions that, as you say, feels like an interrogation. What about this? How often do you do that? Do you do that? And they're like, can you imagine if they have like 10 salespeople come and they're visiting with 10 salespeople every week? and every salesperson interrogates them. Now, what if somebody walks in like you, and you, you already know what the situation is, but this time you come in different and say, look, Mr. Customer, I've studied your business. I've worked with other companies in your industry. And here are the top three problems and challenges they're facing. One, two, three. Did I get that right? Now, all they have to do is confirm like, yeah, you get it. Padawala, you get it. The hair, you get it. And all of a sudden you build credibility instead of asking them 100 questions, because they're thinking, you should have known this before you walked in. Like even on LinkedIn, uh, I did this, uh, uh, I think it was a podcast, I, I called it LinkedIn loonies. LinkedIn loonies are people who are crazy and stupid, which is they connect with you, and then they're like, Victor, great to connect with you, would love to get on a call to learn more about your business. Really? You want to learn more about my business. Why don't you read my bio, my profile, my business history, try to understand what I do, do a little research, and then come back with an intelligent question. So you are absolutely right. Uh, we got to update that. So, you know, asking a lot of questions as an interrogation is not a great strategy. Uh, let's watch this in full later. I don't know. You guys are talking amongst each other. All right. Do your thing, man. All right. Vera Kartik from Malaysia. All right. Arvin Garcia. Arvin, I'm a technical marketer. I offer websites for small business owners. How do I apply what you teach today when I create websites with funnels? Mostly it's an upsell approach to get more sales. That is a good question because I know what you're doing. Because uh, I've used several uh, like Infusionsoft, I've used uh, like ClickFunnels and many of the other products, because it's always about the upselling, right? Get them into the funnel and then keep upselling them more and more and more. Um, I'd have to think about that, Arvin. That's a really good question. How would you do it through a web page? I have to think about it, Arvin. You stumped me, okay? Like I said, my mother said, never make things up. If you don't know, say you don't know. But now you force me to have to go research this and figure out how would you use downselling in a funnel application? Thank you, Arvin, for a great question. And now I'm not going to sleep tonight because I'll probably be researching this question for our next conversation. Thank you, Arvin. And sorry, I can't give you an answer, man. Uh, Aaron, sold the car insurance and how to upsell with personal loan. So you want upsell with, yep, sold the car, uh, sold the car insurance, and now you want to actually get them to take on a personal loan. So you're upselling them on a personal loan. So the question is, how do you upsell them on a personal loan? Well, the thing is, keep in mind that cer certain things happen here, Aaron, that, that you gotta be careful with. You're selling somebody a car, right? And then on top of that, they gotta get the insurance for the car. Customers go through this, this fatigue. They get tired of making decisions. And so you just sold them a car, you just upsold them on car insurance, and now you wanna upsell them on a personal loan. My question is, wouldn't it be a better strategy? Now, if you can do all three, and you figured that out, great. But if you're having trouble selling the third one, may I suggest, because I've seen this a lot, is that there is something called client fatigue, decision-making fatigue. People get tired of making decisions. And so there's a point where they don't wanna make a whole new decision. Getting a personal loan after buying a car is a whole new decision. What if you followed up after a week or two with that client and then tried to upsell them on the personal loan? You called to make sure that everything's great with the car, you got this car insurance purpose, and they said, by the way, while I have you on the phone, and then try the upsell there. I would try to space a little bit of time, but if you're doing it right away and it's working, I'd love to figure out how you're doing it, okay? And it is an unsecured loan, as you just put, so I saw that. Because that's a, it's a personal loan, so it's unsecured, right? You got it. I would put some time between those two decisions. There is, look up, look up um, decision-making fatigue, and you'll see different studies that, you know, when we're buying a house or we're buying a car, a car is probably the best example, 
you know, after two hours, which is, you know, in some cases it could be up to five hours, you're tired of making decisions. And then you just say, that's enough. I don't want to make any more decisions. All right. The Grand Fire Buffet. Uh, so, Victor, any book recommendations to learn nudging and stop pushing? There's a book called Nudge. Get that one. Start there. There's also another book called Sway. That's another book. Uh, there's uh, the famous book by Robert Cialdini, which is called Influence. Another great book. There's three for you right there. So, great question. Uh, oh, <laughs> it's okay. We are, you know, the D word. The D, no discount. We don't do discounts here. But anyway. Uh, love your presentation, specifically visuals like graphs of resistance versus trust. Excellent. So I use that to kind of visually show, you know, what's going on. Somebody asked me the question to hear about um, about my, my drawings. And they said, do you just like create those on the spot? I go, no, I, I, I got to draw things out. I'm always, uh, like I think I showed you guys my, I got a lot, this is not what I was doing today, but this is, you know, I got index cards. You can't really see them, but there's a lot of drawings on my index cards. And what I do is when I'm thinking of a concept, I'm always like drawing these out. I know you can't really see it, but I'm always drawing out boxes, right? So I do this all the time just so I can understand something. And so uh, it doesn't come naturally. I actually have to work at drawing things out. So thank you for bringing that up, man. I appreciate that. Jing Yi. Jing Yi, where are you from, man? Great picture, man. <sighs> Yeah, when discounting price, you're discounting your value. You got to believe yourself and the product. There you go. Uh, remember what Mac Hannon said years ago, the guy who wrote consultative selling. Mac Hannon wrote consultative selling. I think it was in 71, 72, still one of the best sales but Today, that guy was so ahead of his time. And he said, discounting is the ignorance tax you pay on not knowing the value of your product. Discounting is an ignorant tax you pay for not knowing the value of your product. And I would add to that, and not believing the value of your product. Now, again, uh, and you got it, down, sell, got it. So, I mean, people ask me, so Victor, you've never discounted? Of course I have. But remember, when I discount, I ask for a commitment in return, whether it's a long term. Sometimes it's give me two years of the contract instead of one, or buy more of that or buy more often. So find a way to ask. That way you're conditioning your clients to say, if they're gonna ask for a discount, you're gonna ask for something back. Rod, you're back again. How to make the process of customer purchasing, say $5,000 worth of product of an initial sale to upping him to a 100K sale faster. So what's the process of moving from 5,000 to 100,000? When I was selling technology products, I'm assuming if it's a big product, it has to be this expensive. It has to be, you know, expensive like a technology product. So we would always do like, for example, field trials, right? This is where they actually try the product, right? And by the way, we would qualify the opportunities. We said, look, if you're buying the field trial, we can do this for $5,000. And then the next phase would be that we put in, let's say, system one beta. And then that would be, you know, something like $50,000. And then if we want to explain to different networks, Da, 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 we'll get to the half a million. So I would create milestones. And the first one was obviously getting the first 5,000. Once I got the first 5,000, you create a roadmap to where you want to take them. I think that's the vision and over what time. And if you can put those two things together, then I think you have a good plan. And again, what's good about this rod, if you begin to think like this, creating roadmaps, you know, to where they're going, then when you're talking about it, you can say, you know, this is phase one, this will be phase two, phase three. And typically at the end of year two, this is what it's going to look like. And then maybe that's a way of getting them there mentally. So you're very welcome to hear on that one. Aaron, you're very welcome as well. And then Ching Yi's from ah, Toronto, man. I love Toronto. Uh, Toronto is almost like Minnesota. I used to live in Minnesota for 10 years, man. It's almost the same thing. Uh, the Grand Fire Express says, Victor. Thanks, Victor. I'm a seven, I'm new, 17 year salesperson, and I really had no idea why I was starting to piss some people off by asking questions. <laughs> so, what do you recommend for a new salesperson to get to the top? Again, I think one of the things is, and I talked about this in uh, in the past, is that you got to know the product. So, remember, if you know the customer, if you understand the customer, right? You understand, you know, your products, right? And then you understand their market. And then right here is, I always say, the sweet spot. So really understand your customers, really understand your products so you can recommend them, but also understand the market they're dealing with. Like that, you can be more sensitive. And this works in the B2B or B2C, doesn't matter. Okay, we got Caribbean Cyberstream. 
You give 10% off and ask for a two-year contract. What if the clients don't want to commit and threaten to go by a competitor to get the work done? Bye. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's one of those things that, you know, it depends how bad you want the business, you know, CyberStream. You know, if, you want, if you're desperate for the business, uh, then you'll probably want to take the deal, right? But remember, you start giving discounts, you give them a 10% discount, the next time they come back, they want to start from where you left off. So if you charge them a thousand bucks and they get, say, give me a 10% discount and you sold it at 900, when they come back, they're going to start where? Right there, right? And so it's, it's, it's a trick sometimes. And I would argue with you that in the end, it's really not price. Yeah, you could make the argument that 10, 20% of the population will buy on price. I give you that. I, I concede that. But if, if it, a 10% is a make or break deal, then I would question whether or not you build enough value in the presentation because you and I have always paid a little more. You know, knowing we can get it cheaper, but I'd rather do business with you. You ever have that experience where you just rather pay a little more because you know the person, you trust them, they understand you, they have your, their best interest, your best interest in mind. So you know what? I'd rather deal with you even though I'm paying a little more, but I know I can trust you. So maybe we need to elevate the trust relationship in order to get the price. So, but again, some people will go to somebody else and I go, that's fine. You know, I, that's happened to me. How to sell an audit tax and consultancy when people only buy from race and skin color. I have no idea, Vera, how to deal with that one. Uh, if you're dealing with people who just judge you by what you look like, then you're targeting the wrong people. I hate to say it that way, but you can't sell to ignorant people. You know, because the only color that should matter is what? Green. Those are smart people. So, you know, better marketing, maybe uh, different targets that you can go after. Tough one to answer. Tough one. Very tough one to answer. Dimitri Wolfson. There's no problem asking questions that the prospect thinks it will generally help you find them the right product. Absolutely. So, by the way, let me be clear. I'm not saying don't ask questions, but ask intelligent questions. Don't ask the ABC questions. Ask the high-level questions, the, the type of questions that really demonstrate that not, you not only understand their business, their market, their products, you understand their real pain. Those are the questions. It's those questions, and you're absolutely right. It's those questions that make them go, hmm, nobody's really asked me that question before. Hmm, I never looked at it that way. That's a great question. Let me think about it. These are insightful questions. So let's, let's kind of divide them. There's basic questions and there's insightful questions. I think we will both agree, Dimitri. It's those insightful questions that allow them to not only, you know, think differently, but maybe clarify their thinking so they can make a better decision. So I'm with you on that, man. Great questions, man. Victor, love your content. I have one question. All right. When is a good time to make a cold call to a high potential client? Just having this discussion the other day again with somebody else. Different studies show different things, but the best time to call somebody is any time that you need to pick up the phone and you're available to call. I mean, that, that's really the answer. But if you try to you know, put these studies together and try to figure out when the best time is, here, here, are, the, here are the times I was given, and I kind of believe it. You know, if you look at the, it could be the 11 to 12, and then the 4 to 5 p.m., these are the ones. So this is a.m. to noon and then p.m. to p.m., right? They're right before they go to lunch or towards the end of the day when they're, they're winding down their day. But the real answer is, man, just pick up the phone and call because sometimes you just get lucky. You know what I mean? So anyway, that's the best answer I can give you. Some will, some won't. There you can see there it is. That, that's You know what, Jake? I think I'm going to end on that one, man. When, it talk, when you talk about people who want to buy or don't want to buy, as you say, some will, some won't. So what? Next. Let's go to the next one. Anyway, uh, if you like this, let me know. Here are my final thoughts. I got this new graphic for my final thoughts here. So my final thoughts on upselling and cross-selling. Remember that when we're talking about downselling, right? When we're talking about really trying to you know, sell more, we're thinking long-term, not short-term. We're thinking long-term. How do we do this? So by letting customers know they don't have to buy the whole package, you're transmitting that, look, I'm not trying to stick my hand in your pocket. I really only want you to buy what you need. Not what you want, but what you need right now. Because I want your business down in the long run, right? I want it long term. That's what you're transmitting. So again, if you love these videos, do the whole thing. Share, like, subscribe underneath. Uh, do me that favor. And again, Sunday we're going to talk about... 
that right there, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna pull out what I think is the best of the best of what was in here. And there's two or three systems, well, I have two systems in here that I really like that I want to share with you. And so uh, that's gonna be the deal. And again, remember, do me a favor, share this with at least one other person. That's all I ask. And last but not least, hey, have you guys checked out my my uh, uh, live stream highlights? Because some of you may be on my live stream highlights. If you go to my YouTube channel, right, which is probably on now, some of you may be in there. So what I do is I take some of your comments, you know, for the last week, and I combine them into a compilation. So check it out because some of you may be on there. On that note, thank you right back to all you guys. You guys are awesome, man. Always enjoy hanging out with you guys. Take care. Have a great night. And remember, selling ain't hard.